Swan's Way, Cambrai 2, Part 11, by Marcel Proust. If it was fairly easy to go the Mesegli's way, it was a very different matter when we took the Germant's way, for that meant a long walk, and we must make sure first of the weather. When we seemed to have entered a spell of fine days, when Francoise, in desperation, that not a drop was falling on the poor crops, gazing up at the sky and seeing there only a few white clouds floating on its calm azure surface, groaned loud and exclaimed, You would say they were nothing more, nor less than a lot of dogfish swimming about and sticking up their snouts. Ah, they never think of making it rain a little for the poor farmers. And then, when the wheat is all ripe, down the rain will come, pitter-patter all over the place, and think no more of where it is falling than if it was on the sea. When my father had received the same encouraging answer several times in succession from the gardener and the barometer, then someone at the table would say, tomorrow, if the weather holds, we might go the Germant's way. And off we would go, immediately after lunch, through the little garden gate that dropped us in the Rue de Berchamp, narrow and bent at a sharp angle, dotted with grass plots which over two or three wasps would spend the day botanizing, a street as quaint as its name, from which its odd characteristics and its cantankerous personality were, I felt, derived. A street for which one might search in vain through the Cambrai of today, for the public school now rises on its former site. But in my dreams of Cambrai, like those architects, pupils of Violette Le Duc, who, fancying that they can detect behind a Renaissance rood screen in a 17th century altar traces of a Romanesque choir, restore the whole church to the state in which it probably was in the 12th century. I leave not a stone of the modern edifice standing. I pierce through it and restore the Rue de Bouchon. And for such reconstruction, memory furnishes me with more detailed guidance than is generally at the disposal of the restorers. The pictures that it has preserved, perhaps the last surviving today and destined soon to follow the rest into oblivion, of what Cambrai looked like in the days of my childhood, Pictures that, simply because it was the old Cambrai that traced them in me before it vanished, are as moving, if I may compare a humble landscape with glorious effigies, reproductions of which my grandmother was so fond of bestowing on me, as those old engravings of the Last Supper, or that painting by Gentile Bellini, in which one sees, in a state in which they no longer exist, da Vinci's masterpiece and the portico of St. Mark's. We would pass in the Rue Lerceau before the old hostelry of the Oiseau Fleché, into whose great courtyard would sometimes enter the coaches of the Duchesse de Montpensier, de Gamont, and de Montmorency, when they had come down to Cambrai for some litigation with their tenant farmers or to receive homage from them. We would come to the mall, among whose trees I could see the steeple of saint Hilaire, and I would have liked to be able to sit down and spend the whole day there, reading and listening to the bells, for it was so charming there and so quiet that when an hour struck, you would have said not that it broke the calm of the day, but that it relieved the day of its superfluidity and that the steeple, with the indolent, painstaking exactitude of a person who has nothing else to do, had simply, in order to squeeze out and let fall the golden drops that had slowly and naturally accumulated in the hot sunlight, pressed, at a given moment, the distended surface of the silence. The great charm of the Grimaud's Way was that we had beside us, almost all the time, the course of the vivant, we crossed it first, ten minutes after leaving the house, by a footbridge called the Pont Vu. And every year, when we arrived at Combray on Easter Sunday, after the sermon, if the weather was fine, I would run there to see, amid all the disorder, 
that prevails on the morning of a great festival, the sumptuous preparations for which make the everyday household utensils that they have not yet contrived to banish seem more sordid than ever. The river flowing past, sky blue, already between banks, still black and bare. Its only companions, a clump of daffodils, come out before their time. A few primroses, the first in flower, here and there burn the blue flame of a violet, its stem bent beneath the weight of the drop of perfume stored in its tiny horn. The Pont Vieux led to a towpath that, at this point, would be overhung in summer by the bluish foliage of a hazel tree, which under a fisherman in a straw hat seemed to have taken root. At Cambrai, where I knew everyone and could always detect the blacksmith or grocer's boy through his disguise of a beetle's uniform or choir boy's surplice, this fisherman was the only person whom I never was able to identify. He must have known my family, for he used to raise his hat when we passed, and then I would always be just on the point of asking his name when someone would signal me to be quiet or I would frighten the fish. We would follow the towpath that ran along the long top of the steep bank, several feet above the stream. The ground on the other bank was lower and stretched in a series of broad meadows as far as the village and even to the distant railway station. Over these were strewn the remains, half buried in the long grass of the castle of the old Count of Combray, who, during the Middle Ages, had had on this side the course of the vivant as a defense against attack from the lords of Gourmand and the abbots of Martinville. Nothing was left now but a few stumps of towers, breaking up the broad surface of the fields, hardly visible, broken battlements over which, in their day, the crossbowmen had hurled down stones. The watchmen had gazed out over Nove Point, Clairefontaine, Martinville, Le Sec, Bayou Les Ans, fiefs, all of them of Guermont. A ring in which Cambrai was locked today, level with the grass, climbed and commanded by boys from the Christian Brothers' School who came there to learn their lessons or to play during recess, emblems of a past that had sunken down and nearly vanished into the earth, that lay by the water's edge now, like an idler taking the air yet giving me strong food for thought, causing me to add to the name of Combray, to the little town of today, a vastly different city, seizing and holding my imagination by the remote, incomprehensible features of olden days that is half concealed beneath the buttercups. For the buttercups were very numerous on this spot, which they had chosen for their games among the grass, standing singly in couples in whole companies, yellow as the yolk of eggs, and glowing with an added luster. I felt, because being powerless never failed to give me, I would let, because being powerless to consummate with my palate the pleasure that the sight of them never failed to give me, I would let it accumulate on their gilded expanse until it had acquired the strength to create in my mind a fresh example of extravagant beauty. And so it had been from my earliest childhood, when from the towpath I had stretched out my arms toward them before I could even spell their charming name, a name fit for the prince in some French fairy tale that had perhaps come centuries ago from Asia, but naturalized now forever in the village, well satisfied with their modest horizon, rejoicing in the sunshine and the water's edge, faithful to their little glimpse of the railway station, yet keeping nonetheless, as do some of our old paintings in their plebeian simplicity, a poetic splendor from the east. I would amuse myself by watching the glass jars that the boys used to lower into the vivant to catch minnows, and that, filled by the current of the stream in which they themselves also were enclosed at once containers whose transparent sides were like solidified water and contents plunged into a still larger container of crystal, liquid and flowing, suggested an image of coolness, more delicious and more provoking than the same water in the same jars would have done, 
standing on a table late for dinner, by showing it as perpetually in flight between the impalpable water in which my hands could not rest and the insoluble glass in which my palate could not enjoy. I decided that I would come there again with lines and catch fish. I asked for and was given a morsel of bread from our lunch basket. I threw into the vivant pellets that had the power, it seemed, to cause the phenomenon of supersaturation, for the water at once grew solid about them in ovoid clusters of emaciated tadpoles, which, until it had no doubt been holding in solution, invisible, but all ready to enter the age of crystallization. Presently, the course of the vivant became choked with water plants. At first, they appeared singly, a water lily, for instance, which the current across whose path it had unfortunately grown would never leave at rest for a moment, so that, like a ferry boat mechanically propelled, it would drift over to one bank only to return to the other, eternally repeating its double journey. Thrust toward the bank, its stalk would be straightened out, lengthened, strained, almost to the breaking point, until the current again caught it. Its green moorings swung back over their anchorage and brought the unhappy plant to what might rightly be called its starting point, since, since it rested there only a moment before moving off once again to repeat the same maneuver. I would still find it there, on one walk after another, always in the same state, suggesting certain victims of neurasthenia, among whom my grandfather included, my Aunt Leonie, who present without modification year after year the spectacle of their bizarre habits, which they always imagine themselves to be on the point of shaking off, but which they always retain to the end, caught in the gears of their own maladies and eccentricities. Their futile endeavors to escape serve only to actuate its mechanism, to keep in motion the clockwork of their strange, ineluctable, deadly regimen. Such was the water lily, similar also to one of those wretches whose peculiar torments repeated indefinitely throughout eternity aroused the curiosity of Dante, who would have inquired of them at greater length the particularities and the reason for their punishment from the victims themselves had not Virgil striding on ahead obliged him to hasten after him at full speed, as I must hasten after my parents. But farther on, the current slackened, where the stream ran through a property thrown open to the public by its owner, who delighted in aquatic gardening, so that the little ponds into which the vivon was here diverted were veritable gardens of water lilies. As the banks at this point were thickly wooded, the heavy shade of the trees gave the water a background that was ordinarily dark green, although sometimes when we were coming home on a calm evening after a stormy afternoon, I have seen it, its depths a clear, crude blue that was almost violet, suggesting a floor of Japanese cloisonne. Here and there on the surface floated blushing like a strawberry, the scarlet heart of a water lily, set in a ring of white petals. Farther along, the flowers were more numerous, but paler, less glossy, more thickly seeded, more tightly folded and disposed by chance and festoons, so graceful that you would believe you saw a drift on the sea, on the stream, as though after the melancholy stripping of the decorations used, for some outdoor feet, moss roses and loosened garlands. Elsewhere, a corner seemed to be reserved for the commoner kinds of water lilies, of a neat pink or white like rocket flowers, washed clean like porcelain with housewifely care. While a little farther on were others, pressed close together, in a veritable floating flower bed, as though pansies had flown out of a garden like butterflies and were hovering with blue and burnished wings over the transparent shadowy, shadowiness of this watery garden, the celestial garden also, for it set beneath the flowers 
a soil of a color more precious, more moving than the color of the flowers beneath themselves. And whether when it sparkled in the afternoon beneath the water lilies in the kaleidoscope of a happiness alert, silent and mobile, or whether toward evening when it was filled with some distant port with the roseate dreams of the setting sun incessantly changing so as always to remain in harmony around the more permanent tints of the corollas themselves with all that is most profound, most fleeting, and most mysterious, with all that is infinite in the hour it seemed to have made them flower to the heart of the sky. After leaving this park, the vivant bank began to flow again more swiftly. How often I have watched and longed to imitate when I would be free to live as I chose, a rower who had released his oars and lay stretched out on his back, his head down in the bottom of his boat, letting it drift with the current, seeing nothing but the sky that slipped quietly above him showing on his features a foretaste of happiness and peace. We would sit down among the irises at the water's edge. In the holiday sky, a lazy cloud streamed out to its full length. Now and then, crushed by the burden of idleness, a carp would heave up out of the water with an anxious gasp. It was time for us to picnic. Before starting home, we would sit for a long time there, eating fruit and bread and chocolate on the grass, over which came to our ears horizontal, faint, but solid still and metallic, the sound of the bells of Saint-Hilaire, which had melted not at all in the atmosphere. It was so well accustomed to traverse, but broken piecemeal by the successive palpitation of their sonorous strokes, throbbed as it brushed the flowers at our feet. Sometimes, at the water's edge and embedded in trees, we would come upon a house of the kind called pleasure houses, isolated and lost, seeing nothing of the world save the river that bathed its feet. A young woman whose pensive face and fashionable veils did not suggest a local origin and who had doubtless come there in the popular phrase to bury herself, to taste the bitter sweetness of feeling that her name and still more the name of him whose heart she had once held but had been unable to keep or unknown there stood framed in a window from which she had no outlook beyond the boat that was moored beside her door. She raised her eyes with an air of distraction when she heard through the trees that lined the bank the voices of passerby of whom, before they came in sight, she might be certain that never had they known, nor would they know, the faithless lover that nothing in their past lives bore his imprint with nothing in their future would have occasion to receive. One felt that in her renunciation of life, she had willingly abandon those places in which she would at least have been able to see the man she loved, for these where he had never trod. And I watched her as she returned from some walk along a road where she had known that he would not appear, drawing from her submissive fingers long gloves of a useless charm.